All right, what a wonderful crowd we have. Lots of familiar names, and we are so glad to see you this afternoon to share what I think will be a very special uh, hour with our friend Miguel Flores Viana. If you just joined us, we're about to begin his presentation on A Wandering Eye, Color, Light, and Culture. Just a bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, if you have a question at any time throughout Miguel's presentation, please feel free to submit it through the chat or the Q&A. Um, we'll take those questions at the end of the presentation and Miguel will address them before we sign off. Um, you can also send your questions directly to a cell phone number that I will uh, put in the group chat. And so you'll have access to that in case you would prefer to text. And with that, I will hand over um, the screen to Paul Whalen, the chairman of the Sohn Foundation, who will introduce our lecture series and our special guest, Miguel Flores Viana. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Michael. There I am. Uh, uh, for the, I think most of you actually know who Michael is, but if you don't, Michael is our, our brilliant new executive director who just joined us last spring, and uh, he helped put together this whole series working very closely with our uh, wonderful program committee, which is led by Jonathan Hogg. And I hope that Jonathan's on the line here today from somewhere from Florida, I believe. Um, we're so glad that you could all join us today for the start of our 2020-2021 season. We will focus on the ideas of color and light, knowing that this year in particular, uh, we're, both, we're all, frankly, in desperate need of both. Uh, Sir John Soane was fascinated by light and the effects it could produce. He used color windows, stained glass, mirrors, richly pigmented surfaces, and inventive skylights uh, to create dramatic and ever-changing scenes. Inspired by Soane and his museum, our series considers the interplay of light and color across periods and disciplines from Soane's world to arenas of art, architecture, and design in the 21st century. Our events will range widely between personal reflections, which is what we'll have today, um, to um, academic lectures, informal talks, and panel-style discussions. We hope you will enjoy, uh, join us for the entire season, and the full calendar will be released uh, in October. When you see it, you'll see that we prepared a really rich feast for you. And, but because times have been so very, very bad, and you've all been so very, very good, we've decided to serve up dessert for you first this year in the form of a journey with Miguel Flores Viana, who is with us today. Miguel has been a photographer, a writer, an editor, uh, and an editor for more than 20 years. His transporting photography is regularly published in Architectural Digest and Cabana. And Miguel's first book, Hope Bohemians, was selected as the design book of the year by T Magazine. In his latest book, A Wandering Eye Travels With My iPhone, he used the same little device that many of you have in your pocket right now to create an extraordinary visual diary of his travels through 14 countries and five continents. Today, Miguel joins us from his home in London, where he will take us on a journey through some particularly memorable, memorable photos and the stories behind them giving us a glimpse of color, light, and culture through his very special lens. Miguel, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everybody. Good afternoon in New York. Good evening here in Europe. It is my pleasure to be with all of you um, um, starting this series of talks that um, the Stone Foundation will um, sort of unfold throughout the year. Um, I was just telling Paul and Michael that uh, I feel some, somehow a little bit of an imposter because I'm not an architectural scholar. Um, and I just react to architecture in the same way that I re react to lots of things, just instinctively and I guess with the heart. So um, for this series, I wanted to, show you a series of, of, of um, places and buildings that I have seen in the last past 10 years, more or less, 
which uh, somehow all of them, the connecting sort of thread through all of these stories is the human story, which I hope I will be able to introduce as I talk to some of these buildings. Um, so to start with, I'm going to go to a place that we have heard a lot of, uh, not exactly good news, and uh, is Syria. Um, I was very lucky uh, to go to Syria and spend 10 days, please, the next one, uh, the next uh, image, um, about 10 days traveling with a friend. And I actually always give credit to my friend because in the year 2009, I said to her, her name is Sandra Nanelli, and I'm sure lots of you know her because she's a very well-known interior designer in New York City. Um, I said to her, oh, I'm, going, I'm going to go to Syria. And uh, a few months later, she said to me, I bought the tickets, we are going. And so in a way forced by her, we ended up going and we spent 10 days in the month of January of 2011, um, exactly three weeks before the civil war started. Um, Syria is an amazing, and very surprising place in many ways. It's, it's a cradle of civilization um, and just about every single important empire that sort of um, came up in the Middle East has had a say on, on, on that piece of land. And of course, all of them have left uh, a lot of imprint in it. Um, from very sort of early cultures to the Greeks, um, the Romans, the Byzantines, and, um, uh, and, and after the Byzantines, the sort of the Islamic civilization. Um, we spent quite a few days roaming around the eastern part of, of, of um, uh, Syria, Damascus, and, uh, and what it used to be uh, Antioch, um, and um, homes, which also became quite famous later on during the war. And eventually we made our way towards the central part and the sort of the more sort of deserty part of the country. Uh, and our sort of destination was the one destination which was sort of the golden destination when you went to Syria, which was Palmyra. And this is what we have in our screen right now. This is Palmyra on a very early sort of Sunday morning. Um, as we sort of roam around this city that was completely empty at the time and unbeknownst to, no, to us, um, a city that in a way has been partially destroyed now. Um, the city was um, sort of came up because it was in the route of certain caravans that were on their way to the Silk Road or from the Silk Road. road. And it became very rich. And as such, um, and that sort of wealth of, of that the city is seen still today in the ruins of the Roman sort of um, um, buildings that are still left behind. Um, in the image in your screen, on the right of the screen, you see the famous arch, which um, sort of welcome you in this long avenue surrounded by um, columns, um, which was a sort of the central area of Palmyra, the ancient Palmyra. Unfortunately, the arch doesn't exist anymore because it's been bombed by the junior, sort of, I think, during junior battle in the ruins of Palmyra. And the, this image, in a way, sort of reflects the richness of that city because, on the one hand, you have this incredible sort of monumentality of Rome, and all the way there, at the end, on top of the hill, you see a 13th century um, uh, Islamic castle built by one of the rulers that came after the Romans uh, to, to, the, to sort of to run, to run this part of the country. Syria is surprising because um, it's, it's a, not only because of the mixture of people that live there, and you often see people who are sort of natives of the country who are very blonde and blue eyes. And if you talk to Syrians, they will tell you they have crusaders blood and I don't know if it's true or not, but you can see there's been a sort of a melting pot of different races. Um, if we go to the next picture, we will see another ruins. And I particularly find this place um, 
quite fascinating. On the way to Aleppo from Palmyra, um, we stopped to see what the Syrians call the dead cities. The dead cities, this is a picture taken in one of those dead cities, are Byzantine cities. And, and they were, um, they sort of were built between the three, the third century and this, the seventh century after Christ. Um, there were cities in the middle of the country and they were built, it's believed, because nobody knows exactly a lot about it. Um, it's, they were um, built by olive oil producers, farmers, who became very wealthy and built these magnificent cities in sort of, which is a mixture of sort of neoclassical styles, but you can also see the imprint of Byzantium. They're called the dead cities because in the seventh century, somehow, and nobody knows why, people abandoned them. There are more than 400 of these remains throughout mostly northwestern Syria. Um, they are extremely beautiful. And that morning that we visited, we had this kind of quite sort of dramatic sky in which sort of, which was a perfect backdrop for this um, ancient stones, which I presume have a lot of iron because lots of them are very red. Um, and, 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 and there was this sort of, there was nobody. We were just the two of us and the person who was driving us. Um, and it was absolutely wonderful to sort of walk, walk around um, these places. I have not heard about them until I actually went to Syria. Uh, and again, it was, a, it was a constant sort of um, going through the country was a constant sort of reminder of how rich the place is and how many cultures have sort of ruled it and have left an imprint on it. Could we see the next one? The next picture. So this picture, which looks like a very, um, almost like a, a sky box, you know, sort of looking into the skies, is, is a roof over an oval courtyard in the city of Aleppo. Um, this building where I took the photograph um, was um, the insane asylum built by a ruler of Aleppo in the 1200s. Um, the, the asylum had a series of courtyards and the last one, which was this one, um, was oval and um, was um, reserved for the, the sort of the patients who were considered less dangerous. Um, and it was actually very uh, interesting because in each one of the courtyards, which were sort of for different type of um, patients, so to speak, um, in each one of them, there was a sort of built-in stage. And uh, we were told that um, the sort of, the ancient sort of um, Muslim civilization um, treated uh, the, the insane through music, that they found that music calmed them, uh, calmed them down. So on a regular basis, almost on a daily basis, there would be music um, groups, bands playing for the patients of the hospital. But as I said, these are all buildings, they're all empty, they're all ruins. And uh, what is the most amazing thing about this place were the people. Um, um, really wealthy, no matter, no matter their sort of station in life. We were lucky that we went with lots of in introductions. So we met the people in Damascus, in Aleppo, who I guess were very well off. They were part of this sort of cultural and sort of financial elite of their cities. But we also were lucky, and that's what I want to see, show you the next picture, um, to see real sort of Syrians that were sort of, at the, sort of sort of poorer end of the spectrum, who were yet as, who were just as um, welcoming and friendly. Um, this picture I took on the way to Aleppo, it was the end of the afternoon. It was January, so the afternoon, obviously the sort of daylight is much shorter, so I presume it must have been around four or five o'clock in the afternoon. And we were in a car going to Aleppo and we knew that we were not going to get to Aleppo until quite late that, that evening. So, 
uh, at one point we started seeing a whole lot of tents in the middle of the desert and we asked the driver who are they and they said they're Bedouins they are sort of nomads and they're sort of here for the winter they come down to the sort of lowlands during the winter and then they go up to the mountains in, in the summer and we asked them is it we asked the driver is it possible to go and see and say, yeah of course so we drove into this sort of nomad sort of um, a, a camp and um, of course nobody spoke English we didn't speak Arabic um, so our driver was a little bit of the translator, he sort of played the translator. And it took two seconds for us to be offered tea and to be brought into one of the tents where we immediately were served bread. And you can see the, the lady who lived in the tent making the bread that she's going to eventually sort of share with us. It was really touching and um, somehow I normally when I travel I, I tend to photograph um, buildings mostly. But somehow during that trip, um, I took a lot of pictures of, of people. And um, as I was going through them, uh, in order to select a few to share with you, I kept on seeing these beautiful faces of old, young men, women. And I, I just wonder what ever happened to them because places like Aleppo have been destroyed uh, quite a lot and and we all know um, Damascus was also uh, damaged during the war so it is my hope that one day that country will find peace and we will be able to go and visit it because I promise you there is a lot a, a lot to see there so on a lighter note we are actually now going to go to Val Gardena and Val Gardena is a, a small village in the Italian Dolomites and is the name of the, and if, um, uh, Michael if you can show me the next picture, the name of this place that I'm going to show with you. So um, it, this place is a, um, is a castle <laughs> um, that had that be, sort of started its days as a, a small garrison up in the Dolomites, in the mountains in, in, in southern Tyrol in, in, in Italy. And um, as time went by, this small garrison became bigger and bigger. And by the time the, 1500, the 1400s sorry, arrived, the family that owned sort of built a full on castle, sort of a huge building, um, which uh, is today owned by, um, not by the same family, but by, by family. Um, this is, so this is the castle of Val Gardena, and what we see here is one of the, the galleries that surround one of the courtyards um, in the, inside the castle. The castle has two, two courtyards. And uh, as you can see, um, some of the walls of uh, Val Gardena are still covered with the original paints, painted in sort of around the 1400s. Um, you can also see a, a, a sort of a collection of, 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 of um, um, cupboards, which are mostly sort of painted in this sort of very rich and colorful Tyrolean um, fashion. If we can see the next one, the next picture. So the, here's Val Gardena, and it's um, right under this huge, imposing, beautiful mountains, um, sort of sheer rock that are the Dolomites. Um, the, the castle, as I said, was, it started off as a small garrison and then eventually ended up um, being built like this as a hunting lodge. And it was built for a family um, called the uh, uh, Balkensteins. The Balkensteins um, sort of were the sort of feudal lords of the area and had held onto that area for since I think the early sort of part of the millennium, millennium around the year thousand and one hundred. Um, it is in a beautiful spot and uh, it has been uh, in the family's hands until the 19th century. Uh, in the 19th century it became a school and then early in the 20th century was bought by a Venetian family called the Franchettis. And the Franchettis are the family that still owns Val Gardena and they still use it not as a hunting lodge but as a 
a sort of summer residence. The castle is too cold and too big to winterize it. So in the winter, it stays uh, closed. So um, I, I was lucky to um, be able to spend different summers during uh, in, in the past few years in Val Gardena, where the, the family sort of uh, spends most of the time looking for mushrooms because they're all sort of mushroom crazy and they all know a lot about mushrooms. And as you can see, the forest around it is perfect for that. But the interesting thing about this castle, and if we can see the next image, please, um, is that when it was bought in the 1920 by um, this baron called Baron Giorgio Franchetti, the interiors of the building had been mostly um, sort of uh, dispossessed of any sort of decoration, except the paintings that were still on the wall, the, the sort of the, the, the uh, plaster uh, uh, walls that were painted were still there. So what Mr. or Baron Franchetti did, he was a great alpinist. And so he spent the first few years in, uh, uh, in after he bought the, the, the castle, he spent sort of walking through the mountains of the Tyrol and looking into cottages or into farmhouses where he could see um, um, woodwork that would be fitting for the castle. So he ended up buying lots, excuse me, lots of interiors of cottages, which he reinstalled inside the castle. This bedroom is one of those sort of, um, uh, sort of farmhouse interiors that he reinstalled. And I have to say that as far as interior decor goes, it's kind of perfect because it smells ancient, it creaks anciently, it is ancient, and it being restored in those, gar in, in those big rooms of the castle have given these rooms a new life. It is incredibly charming um, to be there. It's sometimes a problem in the middle of the night if you have to have a sort of bathroom run because you have to sort of run through corridors and you don't know if there's a ghost or, or there's a sort of broken window where you're gonna freeze as you go by. So that is a bit tricky, but it, it's, it's, it's a beautiful place. Um, this is one of the rooms. I think I have another picture coming up. Um, and this is another of the bedrooms in, in the castle. This one is particularly, it's quite sort of foreboding in a way because it's been treated with smoke. The, whoever built that room in the original building where that room was built, um, it's uh, treated the wood with smoke, giving it that really dark color. The family calls it the black room. The other amazing thing about the, the about Val Gardena is, as I said, it's not prepared for the winter, so it's not heated. So the only heat the rooms have, uh, which you need every night because it's quite high up in, in the Alps, are these beautiful 18th century Austrian um, um, uh, stoves. You can see one of them up you can see it partially on the right hand side of the of the building. Um, it is quite a charming place and as I said it's, it's considered the highest um, built castle in the Alps. I, I think is there's no other castle in a sort of higher sort of position or at least surviving and it, it's only used now during the summer. And if we look at, and, and but what, the one thing that I said, I'm always touched by the human story behind things. And sometimes the human story is of the moment, something charming happens and I get totally uh, captivated by the place I'm visiting. And sometimes the, 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 the human story has a little bit of history. So I'm gonna ask Michael to play a, a little bit of music that we, and I'm going to tell you about this man. Can you play the music? Uh, I wonder if you can bring the... Can you hear it, Miguel? Yeah, no, yeah. But I think you have to, now I cannot hear it. So okay. maybe you helped me. Mm. 
Thank you. So that little bit of music that you've heard was composed by this man. This man was Oswald von Wolkenstein, and he was one of the lords of this castle. And in fact, um, the Franchetti, the family that owns now, is I think is they're very proud that they live in this castle that used to belong to this man. And this man had an amazing life. Uh, he was the son of the lord of the area, the, of, of, I guess he was Duke Wolkenstein. And um, at age 10, he left uh, his family and he went around uh, Europe and uh, the Levant and Central Asia singing and composing music. So that little bit of music that we heard was composed by this man. So he left home in the early 1400s and uh, at age 10 and made his way playing music, music that he composed throughout all, throughout all the places that he visited. So he went all the way from Northern Italy, all the way to Persia and ended up visiting Armenia and the Black Sea and by age 23, so 13 years after he had left his family, he's told or he receives the news that his father, the feudal lord of Val Gardena, has died and he has to come back to claim his title. He was the heir. He comes back to northern, to the southern Tyrol, to the Tyrol, and he takes his rightful place. He rules his land, but he also uh, is in the service of the um, um, Holy Roman Emperor. And so as, as, as an, and he becomes an ambassador. He's an ambassador of the Holy Roman Empire in, um, in Spain to the court of, of the kings of Spain. And spends the rest of his life sort of being a feudal lord, a sort of a grand lord of the area but he composed music throughout his life. And today we can still hear his music being played in different venues. And of course, in things like Spotify. The, the music is beautiful to those who understand old German. They say that the, mu the, the, the poetry that he wrote is quite racy because he mostly talks about his love affairs. And, um, but I think that any visit to Val Gardena would not be as charming, at least for me, if I didn't know that this man also roamed that area and that that man had such a brilliant life uh, besides being a feudal lord of, 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 of the place. Um, could we go to the next one, please? Mosques. I love mosques. I think they're beautiful buildings. Um, and there are so many of them and they sort of reflect like most architecture, the area of where they live, of where they have been built. Um, and I don't understand much about the rituals of, of, of sort of the religious rituals within a mosque. Uh, I just find them quite sort of foreboding and quite um, thrilling to be in them when I visit them, whether they're grand or they are, are small. Um, so I decided to show you two different types, um, which I found charming. So here we are, this is Cairo. I grew up in a house with a mother who was absolutely obsessed and fascinated by Egypt. And uh, so conversations about Egypt were normal in my household. And as usual, you know, when you grow up with someone talking about something and you're the child, you like pay no attention. I didn't pay that much attention. When my mother was talking about her latest trip, he, she visited often. Um, but 
finally, and, and I never went. And I don't know if that was, I never went to Egypt. And I don't know if that was because almost a rebellion against <laughs> my parents, <laughs> you know, that, or until last year. And um, I, I fell in love with the place, an incredible place. In, again, so rich in so many things. And uh, of course, I saw all the pyramids and, and, and I went down the Nile on a boat on my own, just with one friend. And that's something that if you can ever do, you should do, because to go down the Nile, looking at the shores at each side of the boat that have not changed in centuries, you think this is an amazing treat. And anyways, but what I love the most about Egypt is medieval Islamic Cairo. Is this an incredible thing uh, filled with mosques, uh, old universities, um, houses, um, schools that were built from the beginning of, uh, I think it was called Al-Qairo. I, I, I think that was the, the, the original name in Arabic of Cairo. And um, this particular mosque, was built uh, was in the year 800, uh, yeah, in the year 800, by a governor of Egypt. At the time, Egypt was a protectorate of uh, the, the sultan that lived in Damascus, uh, in Syria. And um, this governor built this, uh, ordered the, 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 the building of, of this mosque. And um, it's named after him. It's called Ibn Tulum, the, the mosque. It's this incredible place. It's, it's, it's a courtyard, basically, surrounded by galleries on each side of the courtyard, of the rectangle that makes the courtyard. And the, 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 the galleries are double. So there are two, two double galleries. So there's one gallery next to it. There's another gallery. And then eventually it's the courtyard. Um, it sits on top of a hill. In the middle, as I said, in the middle, Cairo is a very chaotic city. It's huge, and it has sort of overpopulated. And it, but this particular part is the medieval part, and it's relatively untouched by new constructions. Um, and this mosque sits on a hill, which local legend said that um, was a hill with where the Ark of Noah ended up. Um, you know, if you go to Armenia, they tell you that it ended up there in Mount Ararat. Here they say it ended up here in the, on, on, on top of this hill. I don't know if that's true, but even Tulum, the mosque ended up there. And if we can see the next one, please, the next picture. And it's absolutely enthralling. It's thrilling to see it, to be there. It's, Again, I was lucky the times that I've been there that it was empty, it was always empty. Um, so I had it pretty much to myself. And what I love about it is that although I presume it may have had more decoration, with the passage of time, that decoration has faded away, the, whatever color it may have had on walls and uh, has faded away. And now it has the color of the desert. That color of that mask is the color of Cairo. The whole of Cairo is of that color. Um, it's it's extremely sort of um, it's a powerful color. That in the end, you know, at the end of the day, you think your skin looks like. I mean, it is the same color because you're covering dust. You know, there's dust everywhere, uh, dust from the desert. Uh, and so this is Ibn Tulum. It's empty most of the time now. It's extremely imposing. And as I said, it's a rectangle with galleries around it. And each, during the, in different parts of the galleries, there are different areas for prayer. In that central uh, building that you see with the dome, there is um, there's just a fountain and, and it's, it's, it's just magnificent. Um, as I said, Cairo is, is, has been, sort of a, a witness to so many cultures. And what you can see in the background is the citadel. And the citadel is actually a 19th, it's, it's, it, it was a place from where the governors of Cairo ruled the country. 
um, after Egypt became Egypt, uh, Muslim. And the, the, the citadel um, obviously was not only a center of government, but it's also a center of religion. And what you see on top, those towers that you see on top, is a 19th century um, mosque built by the Turks, because the Turks sort of ruled Cairo until the 19th century. And it's actually quite, um, I love Turkish mosques. I love those beautiful um, uh, minarets that they have that in a way sort of fill every fantasy of us and Aladdin and Thousand and One Nights. But in a way, in a city like Cairo, it doesn't, they don't really go. They have, it's a different architectural language. Um, they seem to think too fragile. Um, and uh, the buildings, the sort of more sort of um, Egyptian style of buildings, which sort of for, 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 uh, for mosques, which develops in the medieval, uh, in medieval times in this part of Moscow, uh, in this part of um, Cairo, are much more sort of, they're sort of squat, they're closer to the ground, um, and they have a different type of presence. Um, I think I have another image of, of, yeah, this is one of the galleries, and you can see the sort of double galleries. There's one, and then there's the, the next one, and then eventually you see that you sort of enter the courtyard. Um, this top, this, the, one of the, the topics of this uh, talk is light. And one of the most beautiful things about sort of walking through the galleries is to see how the sun sort of changes as the sun moves and to see sort of how the, the shadows in those galleries change constantly. It's, it's really beautiful and sort of quite enchanting. But from this sort of very sort of ochre, deserty, spare, uh, and yet very grand vision of Cairo, we're gonna fly to, a next, to the next place. And this is another mosque, but now we are in Eastern Anatolia. Um, in uh, uh, Eastern Anatolia, again, is this sort of layer, it's a layer, it's almost like a sort of layer cake of cultures, you know, from sort of, um, uh, I think the beginning of civilization to Greeks and Romans and um, Byzantines and Muslims cultures have all left their imprint. And there's of course magnificent monuments. Um, what I'm gonna show you now are four different mosques in surrounding, surrounding a town called Denisli. Denisli is a town that sits at the feet of the Taurus Mountains, very close to the Aegean coast, so, so, so the e, so eastern Anatolia. And um, all these mosques um, were sort of our sort of village mosques. They're very small, they're very humble, um, and they're very used, they're used only by very few people because they sort of the villages are not very big. Um, I actually went there on assignment for a magazine called Cabana, for which I do a lot of work. And our story was actually inspired on another story in another magazine called Cornucopia, which is a magazine that deals mostly on, it, the only, their only topic of Cornucopia is Turkey and the cultures of Turkey. It's a beautiful magazine. And they had done a review of a book about this mosque. These mosques are quite peculiar because normally mosques have very little decoration. Once you go inside, they, they, they have very little decoration. And um, in the uh, Muslim religion, you're not supposed to reproduce human, the human figure, nor the, the figure of, 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 of animals. Um, so normally, once you go inside a mosque, they are uh, either tiles, or otherwise it's just inscriptions of, from the Quran. These particular mosques that you're gonna see now are somehow covered in um, paintings, mostly of um, flowers, also geometrical sort of designs and um, signs that people think are Sufi signs, the sort of um, uh, religious um, Muslim uh, signs. This one, particular one was in, in this small village and we had to hire a, a, a driver who spoke Turkish because the, uh, 
in these villages hardly anybody spoke English. And uh, we drove through the most dramatic landscape. The Taurus Mountains is absolutely beautiful. It's this sort of, they're not necessarily, they're not very high, but they're very rich in vegetation. It's, they're very green. And um, in between the mountains, they're the most beautiful valleys covered with the most wonderful orchards. So from this mosque, we went to the next mosque, which is sort of similar. Um, and it was always a joy, not only to go from, to go and see these very humble, but very beautiful spaces. But at the same time, when you knew that you had to go to the next one, you, to the next mosque, you knew that you're gonna, you were in for a treat because you would most likely have to drive for two hours through a grove of, you know, peaches and mulberries. And uh, it's, it's really, really beautiful. We were there in June. So it's the best time to be there. And in a way, the sort of the joy of that um, nature is reflected in the paintings that cover all these um, buildings, the interiors of these buildings. So this is another village. Um, I was traveling with a friend and, and, and our driver was, we found out later, was concerned that we were going to be we we're gonna miss the light. So he drove like an absolute maniac. And I, we kept on thinking, this is where we're going to end our days. So in the Taurus mountains, you know, sort of <laughs> crashed under <laughs> some sort of peach tree or something like that, because it was kind of, a, I think I never drove, I never been in a car that went so fast. And so we sort of spent three days going to see all these beautiful buildings. Um, I have seen pictures of some of these uh, mosques taken early in the 60s and 70s. And now, unfortunately, the one thing that I, I mean, they are, it's fine, but I don't, I'm not very keen on, they all have wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Um, I have seen the same in this particular interior picture taken, I think it was taken in the late, seven, in the late 60s. And it was covered on, on uh, by in, on individual rugs, sort of all piled on top of each other, and it looked absolutely beautiful. I can sort of imagine what it must have been like to sort of walk into a room that not only had the, those beautiful paintings on the wall, but um, also what the floors were covered in the most amazing rugs. Could we look at the next one, the next picture? Next picture, yeah, here we go. So here you are, this one is another mosque that it, the, we actually got there when they were in the process of covering the floors. And uh, I think this one was my favorite, but it was my favorite because um, we were sort of walking around and the people installing the, 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 the carpeting were also in the same room. And at one point we start to hear the most beautiful music and it was the man doing his, call, the, his uh, call to prayer. But I have never heard such beautiful um, voice. In, and I remember that my friend and, and the people working there will stop and we just listened there for a few uh, minutes until the man was done because he was absolutely wonderful. Um, and I think we have one more of a different mosque. And you, it gives you a sense of, of the richness, and, and yet it's all sort of it's all sort of countryside. Is uh, they are farming communities, and they uh, somehow started this tradition, which is sort of continued, uh, of painting their 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 sort of their, their place of prayers in this um, beautiful um, motifs with these beautiful motifs. And finally, we're gonna go north. And from the warmth of Eastern Anatolia, we're gonna go to Sans Souci uh, in, um, the, in Northern Germany. Um, if we see the, the first picture, please. Um, and Sans Souci was a, is a, is a, is a royal palace, or it's a, royal, a series of royal palaces. It's a royal compound, I should say. And it was started in the 18th century by a king of Prussia. And I, uh, with whom I ended up developing almost a sort of <laughs> personal relationship. And why is that? 
Okay, so although he's been dead for centuries, and of course I probably, even if he was alive, I wouldn't have met him, but um, why is that? So I, in the year 2012, I moved to Europe and I was, I moved to England and initially I spent my first two years in, in England living in a cottage in the countryside, but my partner was living in Berlin. So I would go to Berlin often to, to visit him. And I don't like Berlin. I normally like almost every place, but somehow Berlin is just not for me. And um, I used to, I don't know, it just made, it's a city that made, I feel, I don't know, pressed, a little bit sad. I, I, it's just not for me. And um, I would escape to Sans Souci. So my partner had to work and all sort of things. So I would often escape to Sans Souci to just walk there and spend the day. And Sans Souci is born actually of a similar sort of um, feeling. Uh, there was this king of Prussia called Frederick, and that's what I say that I can understand him very well, that uh, was a king and, and lived in, in Berlin, and he hated Berlin. So he had, I think, done one trip in his whole lifetime to Italy, and to try to recreate Italy, he decides to build Sans Souci so as a way of sort of escaping um, the sort of the strict sort of royal um, ways of the imperial of the royal palace in, 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 in central Berlin, he built Sans Souci. Sans Souci is nothing more than a, 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 a big villa, if you come to think of it, surrounded by the most incredible park. And, uh, and Frederick the Great, designs the whole thing. He draws what he wants, and basically what he wants is one building, one floor, no basement, um, and he just basically wants an enfilade of rooms um, facing the beautiful park that he intends to create. Um, he apparently got in trouble with his architect because his architect kept on telling him, you should have a basement, and he said, no, no basement. He also said, I don't want any steps from the rooms to the garden. I want to just basically walk out of the garden, out of the room into the garden. And you can see there are no steps. And the pictures that, I, that you will see, this one included, were taken during a period of two days. I was in Berlin. And obviously, I just wanted to get out of Berlin. So of course, let's go to Sans Souci. It was really cold, it was extremely cold. It was sort of almost Russia-like cold. And I spent two days walking around the park. All the palaces were closed because um, they're not winterized, I believe. So I just walk around the park. So if we can see the next one, the next picture. Uh, and there you can see the, the sort of the, the building. That's Sans Souci, this one floor. And it sits on, tops of a, on, on top of a hill which um, Frederick sort of designed as well as a sort of step garden. But instead of having flowers, what he created was a vineyard. So what you see, what that's kind of big steps um, that you see in fact are sort of greenhouses that have um, um, fig trees and have, um, 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 grapes, uh, pla grape plants, and uh, pla pl uh, plants of grapes, and which in the, gr in the summertime become completely green. But in the, in the winter, of course, everything is closed. And, and, and this is what you see. And, and um, the, the park is vast. The park was, that's, this is only the only semi-formal part of the garden. The rest is a garden a l'anglaise, you know, sort of romantic garden, you just walk around. But one of the amazing things in the winter is that they cover all the statuary in these sort of, in these kind of wooden boxes. And you can see all of them, there's a fountain beyond those people. That those people are actually sweeping the, the snow. I got there really early. And all those, those little cassettes, those little houses are, are covering um, statues. And they're actually quite beautiful in, in a way, and they look like a sort of art installation. They also look like, to me, some of them especially, 
like this big um, um, sort of, uh, how can I say, but in, in the medieval times, they would just come when they wanted to assault a village, a, a sort of fortified city, they would construct these huge boxes, which would sort of carry people inside and they could sort of shoot um, into the fortified cities from these boxes. And it sort of reminds me a little bit of this. Um, it is a it's, it is a magnificent uh, place, and um, and um, as time went by, it became sort of the most favorite place for the imperial family, and different kings after Frederick built different uh, buildings in different styles um, until the demise of the sort of, of the German monarchy in the early uh, 20th century. Um, Frederick only had that place. He was a very particular man. Um, his sexuality is quite sort of in doubt. Um, he has sort of very strong attachment to other men. And um, he was a music composer. He composed music. And he um, uh, also uh, was a seri serious, sort of, almost a sort of uh, someone who sort of thought about the environment. Um, I can see um, uh, when after the, the uh, way before his time. So um, Frederick, um, in this place, only received his close friends. Um, one of them was Voltaire. Voltaire had his own room in 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 this in this villa, and um, spent I think 20, they were friends for almost 40 years. Um, if we can see the next one, the next picture, please. This is part of the garden. As I said, it's, it's mostly a garden a la Anglaise, um, sort of a romantic garden. I just realized that it's gone really dark. Sorry. <laughs> um, and um, I, uh, it, it was sort of enchanting days that I spent sort of walking around and it was absolutely freezing. The one thing that I love about um, 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 Frederick the Great and about Sans Souci is that um, this man was very particular and he knew what he wanted. And he, in a way, was a little bit of a Renaissance man. And sometimes you get statements quite a bit like that. In the United States, um, you have Jefferson who built, you know, Monticello. Um, and, 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 and Frederick the Great was a bit like that. He designed his, his own palace and, and as I said, he composed music um, and he was very interested in actually bringing up the level of, of, of uh, the, 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 the level of, of, of um, how can I say, of, of life in, in Germany. He wanted people to live well. So he found ways of, of, of um, teaching people how to plan things so they would be more productive. And this is where the next picture comes, I think. If you can show me the next picture. Michael, the next picture. Ah, uh, there you go. And this is why I love this picture. So this is Frederick's tomb. He dies, um, and when he dies, his, his successor, who was a nephew, he had no children, uh, decides that um, he will, won't respect Frederick's um, um, uh, wishes of being uh, buried in Saint Souci. So he's buried in this big grip that belonged to the royal family. And then eventually, um, during the World, World, World War II, the body was moved into some salt mines to preserve it. And finally, after the split of Germany between East and West, it ended up in a church somewhere in West Germany. Finally, it was brought back to Sans Souci because his wishes were to be uh, buried in Sans Souci, right next door to that villa that I show you. Um, he's buried. <laughs> And this is what is really interesting, with his dogs and a very favorite horse. And each dog and each horse has a stone a tombstone just like that. Nothing else is right on, on, on the ground. And, and, and they're all like, there's a line of them. They're all the dogs. And, and then there's Frederick in the middle and then more dogs. 
those were his wishes, and they were finally um, fulfilled in the 1990s after the re reunification of Germany. And you will, you will ask me why the potatoes on the, on the tomb? And that's the first time I went to Ayo, that's what, what I asked too, because the first time I went to I went in the summer, so there weren't a few potatoes like here, there were mounds of potatoes on his tomb. So Frederick, because he wanted, you know, the well-being of the Russian, uh, of the German people, he um, introduced lots of plants uh, to widen the sort of the the eating vocabulary of the Germans. And amongst them, he introduced the potato. He brought the potato to, to Germany. And he is, I don't know, allegedly, the first person ever to make mashed potatoes and mashed potatoes from them became quite famous. And to this day, Germans that go to Sun Tzu bring a potato and leave it on his tomb. So, Again, in a way, this is uh, a little bit the way I am. <laughs> I spend a whole day looking at palaces and amazing gardens, but in reality, what really touches me is that. Um, I think this is our final picture. And yeah, there's Sun to see at the end of the day. You can see those, um, that garden with the greenhouses. What is green in those big steps are actually the doors into the greenhouses. And you can see the constructions that they put on top of the um, statuary around the main fountain in the garden. Um, it is a beautiful place and if you have the chance to go visit it, I highly recommend that. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I think that comes uh, we come to the end of what I have to say. If you have any question, I'll be very happy to, um, to um, to answer them and, and thank you so much for your time and thank you so much um, to Paul and to Michael for inviting me uh, to, uh, to sort of share some of my thoughts with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel, for this fascinating journey across the world through your very particular and special perspective. It has been a delight and I think that um, our attendees have also been delighted because there is a lot of engagement on my phone and in the Q&A. So if you have a couple of moments, I'll read out a few questions to you. And uh, yeah. excellent. Well, you know, I think we all think about the iPhone when we think about you, because your new book, A Wandering Eye, is travels through your iPhone. And of course, your erstwhile Instagram account uh, has been so popular. And maybe again, if you come back on to Instagram, it will be again if you come back on Instagram. So one uh, attendee asks for your, are all of these images shot on the iPhone? And what are your tips for shooting on the iPhone? Okay, so um, no, these ones were actually, all of them were shot with, the, um, with a proper camera. Um, um, the, for example, both places, um, uh, Syria and, 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 and Sans Souci were shot in a more sort of photojournalistic um, way. And it was even before um, I had an iPhone. So they were shot with a proper camera. And then the, the Val Gardena, I shot it for my book. So I shot it for um, I shot it also with my camera and the same, and, and both um, the, the, the mosques in Turkey and Egypt were also shot. So, yeah. In terms of what I, if I have any tips, um, tips are very personal because um, I think your photographs should reflect what you like. Um, in my case, um, I like, um, to compose photographs in a way that is quite balanced. So I tend to, if I'm going to photograph, say, a room, I'm gonna to try to make it as balanced as possible. Um, some people are amazing at taking details. And so they, they just do amazing details in a way that sometimes I say, I wish I could do that that way. Um, so in a way, I think the first thing that everybody should follow with the iPhone because the iPhones are becoming better and better um, is 
just follow your heart, just follow what you want. Uh, don't worry about style or technique. That comes if you keep on doing it. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I'm gonna say, um, and it has nothing to do with style, it has to do with practicality, is that make sure that you save your pictures because that is a problem sometimes with digital photographs that we take a lot of them and then eventually we lose the card, we don't download them, we're not connected to the cloud. And there are, there are lots of sad stories of people who lose beautiful pictures because of that. So it's a bit boring sometimes when you have to follow, you know, you come home and okay, I have to download them and that, but it's very worth it. Because for example, in this case, when I was preparing this talk, I had not seen the Syria pictures basically since I left Syria and that was nine years ago. Um, and so it was so incredible to see everything again. And so I would recommend that, that if you could do that, if you can be sort of, um, um, if you can sort of drill it into your head that every time you take pictures, you download them somewhere else. So you have copies and you know where they are. So whenever you need them or want to see them again, you have access to them. That's excellent advice. Now, Lewis asks where you are traveling to and when. So I, I don't know that we can know when, but where are you traveling next or where do you want to travel next, Miguel? <laughs> well, um, in England, we are going into sort of deep winter and uh, it's, and it's much, the winter here is much, um, uh, it's not as cold as the New York winter, but it's darker than the New York winter. So if we are allowed, it would be nice to go somewhere with the sun sometime um, after Christmas or something like that. But right now everything is so up in the air that I'm, I'm, I'm not making any plans just yet. <laughs> well, you've certainly given us a lot of travel inspiration for the moment mm -hmm. when we can restart our Sewn Travels program, which I will plug briefly there. Maybe you can join us and uh, document this. So one question uh, from a New Yorker is, have you ever had a photography show in the city? I think that's uh, a good never, idea. Yeah. And, and sort of, do you ever come to New York? What is your take on our city? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm a New Yorker. I mean, I lived in New York for 21 years. Um, yeah. I grew up in Argentina and I was sent to school in different places. Um, I, Argentina and, and Africa and, um, um, I was even an exchange student to the United States when I was a teenager and in Europe. And then when I started working, I moved to New York. So in a way, I feel I am a New Yorker. Yes, I love New York. And I think New York is one of the greatest destinations. And on a non-COVID year, I'm there almost every other month. I haven't been since March. Um, uh, when this whole thing started, um, but I can't wait to go back. I love New York. We can't wait for you to rejoin us here. And um, here's an interesting question that relates again to travel. Um, the attendee asks, do you research the places you travel to in advance before you leave, or do you research them while you're there, you know, she's, she appreciates all of the context you gave and wonders about how you build up that historical insight uh, mm -hmm. through your travels. It's, um, it's sort of, um, it's kind of an organic way of approaching places. I mean, sometimes, of course, um, I have to do some research because I say I'm going and I um, have a, um, very little time and I want to see specific things. And then yes, maybe I do research. Other times I prefer not to, I know what I'm going to go see, but I don't want to read too much or see any pictures. And um, I always tell this story and it happened to me in India um, a few years ago. So in most Indian cities um, in ancient times, um, people build water wells, these huge wells that have, are kind of monumental pieces of architecture and you can see them in different cities. Um, and um, I was in Delhi with a friend and um, 
we um, um, and we were going to go to Rajasthan, and, and on the way to Rajasthan, um, the driver had told us that there was an amazing water well in the middle of the countryside in a village. So my friend Googled it, and he said, oh my god, this is amazing, you should see. And I said, no, don't show me the pictures. And so, uh, so we went. I didn't know anything about it. And, and, and it was an amazing, because it was an amazing drive. And, we had to get off the main sort of highway and drive through open countryside. And one of the things that I discovered on that trip is that, you know, I, you know, we always see peacocks and, um, and you always see them in zoos or in very fancy gardens, but I actually never knew where peacocks were, where I didn't even think of them as sort of wild animals. And we start driving through this very sort of, uh, narrow country road and all of a sudden we start seeing thousands of peacocks all over the countryside running on top of buildings uh, running in front of the car and I realized oh my god I guess peacocks are also wild or at least were wild and we had this incredible drive about like sort of 20 minutes and we were like couldn't believe our eyes because they're like thousands of peacocks and eventually we get to this village and, and we ask for the water well, and they say, oh, it's there, whatever. And so we go through this place, pay the ticket, go inside, and walk into this courtyard. And down below, there is this structure that sort of goes down for eight floors. And at the bottom, there is water. And I, I was just, um, it was unbelievable. It was one of the best things I've ever seen. So in that case, no, I didn't know anything. And when my friend told me, oh, you should see this in Google because it looks amazing, I, I said, no, I don't want to see it. And I was very glad. So sometimes I don't want to know what I'm going to see. And I just want to be surprised. But of course, sometimes you have to do it. It all depends with time and all that. But I would suggest to everybody that if you have the time, allow yourself you know, the time for surprises because that's the best part of the trip. Mm -hmm. More good advice from Miguel Flores Viana. And we have time for one last question, which relates more to your interest in architecture specifically and interiors. And indeed, you're well known for your uh, photography of interiors. Christine asks, have you published any books exhibiting a collection? And, and, and we know that you have. So tell us a little bit about that work and maybe how it differs from the kind of photography we've seen today, how your approach varies between uh, types of photography or based on the subject matter you're shooting. Uh -huh. um, I, uh, so I published this book called Odd Bohemians and it was an idea that I had for uh, a while. I always like the passage of time in rooms. Um, I think in, to my, for myself personally, the rooms that I find the most enchanting, the most poetic, the most mysterious are rooms that have been created, uh, that have, created is not the right word, uh, that have somehow happened, if you know what I mean. So someone who has something, puts it in a room, and a chair, a table, a painting, and from that, the room grows with time. I love seeing that passage of time. Mm. And the other thing that I love seeing in rooms is what I call the geography of life. I like walking into a house and I can sort of sense what the people are like or what their likes are, what their interests are, because that is reflected in their, on, on, on their walls, on the objects that they choose, on the things they collect. And um, I, I, I love that. I mean, and so when I did Odd Bohemians, I tried to, in a way, showcase um, places, houses of people who lived that way. Mm. Um, there was not necessarily an interior decorator involved in any of them. It was just someone with taste or no taste, but with something to say um, decoratively. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and that's the way that I chose the houses that ended up on the book. Mm. Um, so I love that. And I, I think that um, it's, it's, some people think that 
you find those places only in Europe. I, I, and I disagree with that. They are amazing places in the United States. And, um, and the United States is a much younger nation and a much younger culture. And yet there's um, some incredible places that are worth seeing and exploring and discovering. Um, it's a very rich country in that way. Um, so the, the houses that made it to my book were very personal houses. And that's the way I like houses in a way. I, I like houses to reflect their owners. Um, Cause it's just basically an, houses that are an extension of them. Um, and, there's been a lot of talk in recent years about how Instagram pushes our sensibility towards the picture perfect. But I've noticed that this, this sort of focus on deeply personal collections and a very individual point of view has also been promoted in a way through Instagram. Have you seen that, Miguel? It feels that there's a growing appreciation for the kind of vision that you describe and that actually Sir John Soane shares, this, this very layered vision of a personal world. Well, I think um, you're right about that. I think one of the things that um, social media, one of the pluses of social media is that in a way it allows the individual voice to come out. So I think Instagram has allowed people to sort of show what they like. Uh, irrespectively of whether what they like is um, fashionable or not. I'm not even going to go into taste because taste is something so uh, personal that it's, I think it's wrong to judge and say if someone has good or bad taste. It's taste. And I'd rather have taste than no taste. <laughs> so if someone has taste, I'm all for it. And I, one of the things about Instagram is that it has allowed people to show who they were in that sense and show the, the spaces where they live and the spaces that inspire them. And in that sense, I think it's been a great education. It certainly has been a great ed education for me. I have learned a lot through Instagram. I have seen a lot of new things. And, 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 and yeah, I think it, 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 you are completely right about that. Well, we'll also go out and buy your book if we don't already own it. A Wandering Eye is available now. And we may not go out, we may order it online, I should say. <laughs> and with that, uh, I want to thank you, Miguel, on behalf of the Sohn Foundation for being with us today. This has been a very special treat. And I think we all have a new way of seeing the destinations that you took us to. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, know, thank you so much. It was a complete pleasure. I loved especially the, uh, the life that you brought into your pictures, your narrative, and also your interest in music and how you brought that into your, uh, uh, your discussion of these images. Uh, it was um, wonderful. Look forward to more conversations. And thank you both very much. Thank you to the uh, Sun uh, Foundation. And uh, let's tell all our friends that next time they're in England, they should come and see the Sewn Museum, um, which is one of the jewels of the British capital. So thank you very much, uh, Michael. And thank you. And to everyone who, has, who is still with us, thank you for tuning in and joining us for this first talk in the Sewn Lecture Series. There will be more. There is another talk scheduled for October 15th, so please go to sonefoundation.org and check out the description for that event with the architect Stephen Hall and register to attend. Um, we'll also be emailing you a complete listing of events, as Paul mentioned, uh, extending through June 2021. So look out for that in the coming weeks. And before all that, the Sewn Museum is reopening on October 1st. So you can follow Miguel's advice um, very soon if you're in London. Uh, there, are, there are new policies set in place to protect visitors. So go to sewn.org to learn more about them. Uh, you can book free timed tickets there to safely visit the museum if you wish to after October 1st, and we would certainly recommend it. So thank you again to all. And um, please note that a recording of this uh, broadcast will be made available in the coming days and emailed to attendees, as well as a list of destinations that Miguel explored. 
So more from us soon. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.